Hi, Greg Godovitz here. It's Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you know what that means. It means, yes, another episode of Rock Talk. This one's number seven. We've had the first three go by. We had double ones. We've got something a little bit different tonight from New York City. There's a friend of mine. His name is Richard X. Heyman. He's the guy that recorded this album. This is the first album I ever heard by him. Uh, this record got stuck in the carousel in my computer when I was writing Travels with my amp, I listened to it for 14 months straight. I became a fan. This is his brand new album. It's called Copious Notes. It's his 14th album he's done with him and his wife, Nancy Lee. She does all the engineering, plays bass and sings harmonies. You're going to get to meet her later. And this is his book that he wrote, Boom Harang, which also translates to Boomerang. So I'm going to leave it at that. Without further ado, Here's my friend, all the way from New York City, the great Richard X. Heyman. Enjoy. So without further ado, here's my new friend who we've never actually met until now, all the way from New York City, the great Richard X. Heyman. Welcome to Rock Talk, Richard. Glad to be here, Greg. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I was uh, reading your book. This book took me one day to read. It is what your wife calls a page turner. Sure. And, uh, aside from the... Uh, the fact that it's got a lot of the same sort of humor that my sick mind comes up with. It took me <laughs> about two weeks to figure out what the title said. I thought, boom, harang. And then my girlfriend finally said, it's a boomerang, you idiot. So great title for a book. And uh, you wrote this in 2002. Well, no, I, I started it back in the old century, in the 1900s. Oh, right. and then, well, it came <laughs> out in 2002. Right? Yeah, yeah, I finished it. But the bulk of it was written in the late nineties into the new century, because I remember there's that crazy election going on, the Bush Gore, was it? Yeah, Bush Gore election. And that was kind of clouding my mind at the time. I think that was a big deal here. And uh, I think I even mentioned it toward the end of the book, but yeah, it's uh, the early, early uh, millennial era. Now, because your name is Richard X. Heyman, you claim hmm. that if you had a nickel for everybody that has ever inquired about the X in the middle of your name, you would have $842 in nickels. Uh, your, but your birth certificate indicates that your name is actually Richard X. Heyman. Uh, I owe you a nickel. What is the story behind that? Yeah, that's a funny one because X became very popular, as I'm sure you're aware. When was that? Like in the 70s, that whole punk thing. Also, everybody had X in their band name, XTC. And Malcolm X. <laughs> there was a band. But I, I think I was actually Richard X before Malcolm even. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure. Anyhow, my father was in the army. He served under General Xavier Cheeves. And he was a general's aide. And I don't know what that means, but that's what he did. And uh, he told the general, if I ever have, her, have a son, I'm going to name him after you. And so after my three sisters were born, I'm the baby of the family. They named me Richard. And it was going to be Xavier. And at the last minute, they changed it to X because they realized Xavier is too Catholic for a young Jewish baby. And I'm now Richard X. Heyman. And when it came time for me to enter showbiz, I just said, I'm just going to use my real name. Now, is it always X with the dot beside it? Because I've noticed on a couple of your releases, the dot is not, be the period is not beside X. It's just laziness, well, laziness or typos. It's X. On the birth certificate, it's X with the dot? I believe so, yeah. Very I have nice. to dig it out, I'm sure. I'm almost positive. Right now, I'm going to ask the wife. Yes, it's X period. Yes. Okay, we stand corrected. Uh, I've always had people come up to me and say, uh, I saw you at my high school and I was going, oh, you, you owe me a dollar. Same sort of idea because I figured if I had a dollar for everybody that said that to me, I'd be a millionaire. Right. Uh, unlike so many musicians from our era, uh, it wasn't the Beatles that initially sparked your enthusiasm for music. It was actually seeing uh, Ed Sullivan with uh, Elvis Presley mm. uh, from the waist up. I remember that one too. Yeah, yeah. So you were, you were actually, your attention went to the drummer who would have been DJ Fontana back in those days. So what, what right. was the, what was that all about? It was pure instincts. 
uh, I don't have anybody in the family who's a musician or musical. My father dabbled a little on trumpet, but wasn't really a musician. So the whole uh, appeal of the drums came from some strange well of you know, creativity or something, or uh, just wanting to uh, express myself. And so I knew I should play the drums when I was five years old. I just started pestering my parents. I need drums, get me some drums. And this must have been based on seeing some drummers on TV and then listening to all these uh, big band albums that my father had. I just, That's right, because your, your house was like a hodgepodge of, uh, uh, of musical styles between your sisters right. and your mother. Your mother took you to Broadway musicals. Right. Uh, your father would take you to see uh, uh, jazz artists at Madison Square Garden. Uh, so how did these these other like with, with that vast array of musical styles, how did that impact on your uh, your That's musicality? Called, it's called eclectic. It's like an amalgam. It's uh, <laughs> potpourri. Uh, you know, it's just a big uh, mishmash of musical styles that invaded my brain and I'm sure a lot of other people of our generation. Because, you know, you're coming out of that old world, our parents' generation, where, you know, I think, you know, some, some kids rejected their parents' music, but I, I really appreciated hearing Benny Goodman. And I love Frank Sinatra and, and I love Broadway shows and Gershwin and all that mixed in with some classical music and uh, Broadway shows, and then my sisters getting into rock and roll. It all just was a big amalgam of, of sounds that was ping-ponging around in my brain. So, you know, in a way, when the Beatles came, it was almost a, a continuation of all that. I, I saw them, you know, some people thought it was just like the darkness, and then the Beatles arrived. but I was loving pop music, especially you know AM radio from 60 to 63, 64. I thought there were oh, of course. great songs in that era. And then the Beatles came along, they, you know, they certainly upped the game and wrote more great songs probably than Yeah, you know, we're gonna get to we're gonna certainly get to those guys. I remember working downtown as a kid myself and uh, my mother worked in a bar where, where a lot of famous musicians went through back Lionel Hampton and Ramsey Lewis and all those guys. Yeah. And I'd be a kid down there watching those guys play. But then, you know, at home, she, she would have the old stereo and it would be uh, Jackie Gleason's music for lovers only, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then of course my two greasy brothers, uh, they were into <laughs> Pat Boone and Elvis and Fabian and all that stuff yeah. until my guys came along. <laughs> but before, before, aside from all that stuff in your life, you were attracted in 63 to Bob Dylan, which I thought, you know, because we're about the same age, I didn't get Dylan for a long time. But what was it about him, aside from the fact that you were, you know, New Jersey and New York is pretty close. What was mm. it about him that grabbed you? It was the sound. I put freewheeling on. And as soon as I heard the first couple bars of Blowing in the Wind, I loved what I was hearing. I loved the sound. Um. 12 years old at the time. And they say 12 may be the most impressionable age in your life. So it's an amazing period because when I was 12 and when you were 12, you had this just explosion of the Kennedy assassination, the Beatles arriving, Dylan comes on the scene and we're 12. And yeah. so we're at that age where things are hitting you really hard because, you know, you get kind of getting out of being a kid. You're just entering the teenage world. But for me, Dylan first just sounded great to me. I, I don't know why. It's the same way that I love really good Appalachian bluegrass singers. Right. There's a certain sound and Dylan had that, and, you know, if he only made freewheeling and that's all he was known for. I think he would be renowned today as one of the great, kind of hillbilly bluegrass singers. And what I love about his singing, and this can be said about a couple other 
artists who have kind of strange voices is they sang the notes. They sang pretty much in tune and non-musicians don't recognize that. But if you listen to Dylan, for the most part, he's right in the middle of every note. Now there's a couple times where he's not, but 98% of the time he's hitting those notes purely like a great hillbilly kind of bluegrass Appalachian singer. And I love that. And, you know, I was just listening uh, to, what's the name, Del, Del, McCrory. Del McCrory, the bluegrass singer. Same thing, they got that twang in their voice, or the Everly Brothers. Yeah. So, so Dylan, to me, was like that. It's just, I thought he was a great singer. And then I'm realizing he's singing about stuff nobody else is, is doing. I mean, he's singing about social issues and, you know, I love the chord changes and uh, it just hit me very hard. I, I think I got him lyrically uh, before I got him, like the, the, the voice, the voice to me was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Yeah. My mother like worked it. with, my mother worked at the Friars Tavern downtown and uh, quite often Lee of the Hawks would play in the afternoons. So one night I came home from Yorkville in the village days, our village days, and she says, you know a guy named Bob Dylan? And I said, well, I, I know who he is. Yeah. And she says, well, he's been hanging around the club the last couple of nights. And last night when we closed, he sat in with Levon and Robbie and the guys. She goes, he's not much of a singer. <laughs> she, <laughs> she she came around to that as well. But, you know. Well, there's so many incarnations of that voice. So you got to yeah. kind of pick and choose which Dylan voice you're talking about. I don't love every one. And as he got older... The tone, what I loved about his tone, in the same way that I like John Lennon's voice, yeah. it had a, a sort of nasal buzzsaw quality, but it also had this bottom end, some depth to it. And that combination, I mean, you listen to Lennon and the Help Error, I mean, it's just so full and rich. Yeah, and for sure. Same thing with, you know, listen to Dylan on the Times Era Change album, or even bringing it on back home. And maybe my favorite period is the um, Highway 61 voice. The voices kept changing. Yeah. And I, I love most of them. There's a couple, you know, now he's kind of lost a lot of the bottom in his voice. And so, you know, a little more stride. But you know, I'm not going to argue with Bob. So Dylan. you got your drums at five. You got a real kid of drums. And now the Beatles show up in 64. Right. What would have happened the minute, because by this time, you're a drummer. I mean, I'm you've got already, like six years of, of experience, like you, you can play the drums. So I'm what, ensconced what have, behind the set, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm when, there. When you saw them on, you actually saw them probably on the, was it uh, the Jack Parr show first? Yes, it's the first time I saw them. And that was just Ooh. a clip from England, right? Yes. I never saw that at the time. I mean, I had to wait for Sullivan. And they're doing of all songs, my favorite Beatles song, She Loves You. So, Is that um, your favorite song? Yeah. I, don't know. You know, I, mean, I, I have to tell you, I mean, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it. People say, what is this, the riff that will set you off? And all it has to be is those drums off the top of that thing. And my radio goes to 10, man. So <laughs> I, I agree with that. Yeah. So what, what did you think when you, when you first, you know, when, when they did Sullivan, let's say? Now you get a chance. Well, by the time they're doing Sullivan, I'm like, you know, I'm already prepared for it because I saw them. I know they're a band. So that first was the initial shock because I wasn't expecting, I thought they were going to be like the Four Seasons who were the big thing at the time. I don't know how yeah. big they were in Canada, but they were huge here. They just had hit after hit. And they were a quartet, but they weren't a band. They had, you know, somebody playing a guitar and, and one guy was playing the bass, but two of them were just standing around singing. So I, I was expecting that. And then all of a sudden they're, they're a band like The Ventures, but they're singing. And I was <laughs> a big Ventures aficionado. I love The Ventures because they they were the benchmark of all early 60s bands. Mm -hmm. had to know your Ventures. And the shadows in England, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, I'm like, dying i can't believe it's an actual band and then my attention goes back to the drums and i'm like oh my god how is he holding his sticks he's holding them like th like this max grip which i never saw before because i'm traditional grip and he's just beating the hell out of it very simple and hard and solid and i'm loving everything i'm hearing and seeing and the hair and the 
<laughs> the voices and the guitar, everything's just killing me. And on top of that, you got, she loves you. These beautiful chord changes, those harmonies. So I'm, I'm a Beatle maniac. The right. bowing at the end of the songs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, it was it was the complete. And then to have a left-handed guy sharing a microphone. I yeah, mean, the perfect. symmetry of the band was just perfect. Right. You know, it, it couldn't. Uh, it, to me, it's almost like it was preordained. Now, you, you lucky bugger, you, you were at Shea Stadium for sixty-five and sixty-six concerts. What was that like? Well, it was more a cultural event than a musical event. It was. <laughs> And I was at uh, Forest Hills in 64. So I saw him in a small, slightly smaller outdoor venue. And even there, you, know, you couldn't make out what song it was for a good you know, 30 seconds to a minute if, if you really tried to figure out what this was. But then once you realized what song it was, you kind of sang along. And the thing with those Beatle concerts, and, and also I saw Dave Clark Five at Carnegie Hall, which was indoors, and that was even That's more. That's cool. Intense, was that you don't get this from all the clips is when you're there there's girls right behind you and right beside you and they're screaming and they're like six inches away from your ears so you have these girls screaming and that's the main thing you're hearing is the girls right in close proximity they're killing you ah just going on for the whole time so that's happening. Then you got thousands of flash bulbs going off at the same time. So it's just this incredible energy, and visual cacophony. And then you realize you're breathing the same air as the Beatles. And that's the big shocker. It's like, you can't believe you're in the same space with them. Yeah. And that's just amazing. You know, the music, you could barely hear. It was exciting. It was great. But I've seen so many 60s shows where it was all about the music. You know, I, I, we'll, we'll get into it. But I mean, from Hendrix to what, The Who, to where there wasn't screaming. So it was all about the music and the visuals. So those were the more musical concerts that really had an impact. But the, the Beatles were, like I said, just an event. I, I in '64 I sat six rows behind the Beatles at the first time I saw them. Oh. So even though we slept out for tickets, I figured we'd be in the front row or on stage. But no, we sat behind them. But you know what? In retrospect, I remember watching as much of what was going on beyond them. I was catching the mania the same way that they were catching it. Mm -hmm. And you were right; it was this onslaught of flash bulbs, and and of course I had two girls screaming <laughs> yeah. inside of my head. I think I was screaming louder than they were. <laughs> Incredible. And now, now to jump from them to a, something else in the same vernacular, on May the 2nd, 1965, your father, Nate, mm -hmm. drives you and your band, which were called the Ascots at that time, mm -hmm. to a building in Manhattan because you had an audition with some sort of music industry guy or whatever, pass for one in those days. And while you actually, you know what, you take over this story right here because it's your story. Well, we're doing our little venture instrumentals and trying to impress some guy. And it's not going that great. We're just playing in there. Take a break. And all of a sudden we hear this guitar ringing from outside the door. Bing, 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 bing. And we said, what is that? We start roaming the hallways and it's getting louder. We're running down, trying to figure out where's this guitar coming from? And we're going this way and that way. And there's a door. I open the door and we're in the Ed Sullivan Theater. The <laughs> Rolling Stones are on stage rehearsing in the afternoon for the show. And they're doing the last time. And we just sort of quietly sat down and watched them rehearse. And it was like a bombardment of color. I mean, it was like so bright. And everything was just illuminated, and their hair, the color of their hair, or the color of the guitars was so brilliant. It was just a spe uh, you know, spectacle. And you're and 13 we, at the time, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, because I would have been 14. Yeah, that's that's an incredible story. I mean, just it's almost out of that movie. Uh, I want to hold your hand. You know, where they're running around looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's, it's almost like that, except it's the stones instead of. I mean, that's an absolutely incredible story. And, and just let me just finish off real quick. I mean, it was great, and we're blown away, and we're just thrilled to be there. But at the same time, as I'm leaving, I, I felt so depressed because they were so great. And I realized, God, we're like not even in the same universe as the Rolling Stones. And will we ever be? And of course, they're not 13 years old. That's true. <laughs> they have paid their dues. I know. It's funny. When the Beatles hit, I realized, okay, the Beatles are approximately 10 years older than me. So in 10 years, that'll be my time. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be the new Beatles. I was convinced. Never happened. But I had that dream. As we all did. Me too. <laughs> In 67, you attended a Murray the K package show. Right. I think we were trying to ascertain whether it was at the Palladium, but one of those big theaters down in, in Manhattan. Uh, I, know, I know who was there, but go ahead and tell, tell people what you saw. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the theater either, but it was, I think, in the 50s, 50-something 50 Street, 52nd Street or something. Well, I wish I could remember the name of it. But it was like a movie theater, a large movie theater. and. Paramount. Okay, the Paramount Theater probably. And um, the headliner was Mitch Ryder, who was, I don't know how he was up in Canada, but he was pretty big down here, had a bunch of heads. So he was the headliner, but debuting uh, on the show were these un totally unknown English acts. One was called Cream, with some guy named Ginger Baker and Eric Clapton. Nobody heard, knew who these people were, Jack Bruce. And the other group was The Who. And it was just like, when The Who came out, I, along with everybody else, but I think I was the first one, jumped to my feet. And it, it was the only act of the day that did this. And this was like a multi-act package show. You could not stay seated. You had to jump up, get on your feet, and just have your jaw drop at what you were hearing and what you were seeing. What we were hearing was the beginning of the song Substitute. And the visual, the visual, you never saw anything like it. It was kind of like they took that early British invasion thing and added this Edwardian <laughs> look to it with these crazy ruffles and real flamboyant outfits. And the drummer was playing a double bass drum set like Louis Belson used to play. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> Three toms across and going absolutely nuts. Totally frenetic style. And this guy on guitar was doing windmills and jumping up in the air. And at one point, a girl from the audience jumped on the stage, ran right past the lead singer, Roger Daltrey, and just put her arms around Pete Townsend, the guitar player. And I remember my little 15 year old brain saying, ah, it's about him. He's the guy, he's the guy. This, this girl must have just known he's the guy. Cause she just ran, I remember she ran right past Roger and I'm like, that's weird. And she leaps over, grabs Pete. She gets thrown off the stage of course. <laughs> and, they did uh, my generation, of course, wrecked all their equipment, which that were, this is the first time we're all seeing that. And yet it seems so right to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, it seemed like totally audacious and why are they doing this? But it just immediately seemed like I totally get this. Now and these shows went like five a day, right? Yeah, they were doing at least five a day and they were doing two to three songs tops each show. Yeah. So... Cream came on, they did oh, I'm So Glad and some other thing. And now, you know, I have to say Cream were very impressive too, but they weren't as visceral, they weren't as exciting as The Who, but it was still the first time hearing that kind of guitar playing, which by that guitar, I mean, Clapton with his sustain and playing blues like that, you know, it was pretty revol revolutionary. I mean, it was just like, and nothing wrong with Ginger Baker, but Keith Moon and, at that age. <laughs> yeah, and then I went several days. And on the final day, which I'm pretty sure was a Sunday, they had the Rascals, who are one of my favorite bands here down oh, yeah. in the States. And 
Dino Dinelli on drums, who is in my top five of all time favorite rock drummers. And he's like the most incredible showman. So in one day, I'm seeing Dino Dinelli, Ginger Baker, and Keith Moon in the same show. And then some, some one day they had Simon and Garfunkel dropped in. They did a few songs. So it was really something. I remember we were talking earlier before we went to air uh, about those 16 magazines. And I think they had Dino Dinelli on the front cover of those as much as they had Paul McCartney. because <laughs> yeah, yeah. They looked exactly the same. Back. Yeah, once he got the, the bangs going. Yeah. He started out like a greaser. He had the hair back. <laughs> They're one of my favorite guy. bands, man. I yeah, got it. I, yeah. After the Ascot, you had the Doughboys, which became quite a happening band. Same I, I band, know. just a name change. Yeah. Name change, yeah. But it, things got a little crazier. And the YMCA, that, that was a, a AM station in New York. The YMCA good guys had a bunch of outdoor events. And you guys had did a bunch of them. But one day you get hired to open up for the Beach Boys. And what happened then? <laughs> <laughs> this was at a big concert. Symphony Hall in Newark, New Jersey. <clears throat> and this is right around the time where uh, uh, Good Vibrations was big. So they were in that era, just so you get a visual of the, the Beach Boys at that point. <clears throat> and we used to close our set with Hey Bo Diddley, the song Hey Bo Diddley. And what I would do is I would come up from the drums and bring my floor tom up front and play with maracas. And our lead singer, Mike Scavone, would play a second floor tom with maracas. And it was this whole kind of act. And we somehow forgot to bring the second floor tom. So we asked if we could borrow the floor tom of the Buckinghams, who were the other group on the bill. But they said, no way. So then we just <laughs> got the you know, hutzpah to ask. <laughs> The Beach Boys, can we use your floor tom for the set? <laughs> they were like, uh, yeah, all right, all right. So we got Dennis Wilson's floor tom, and we do Hey Bo Diddley. And it is this savage performance. I mean, we're we, showing it right now, by the way. Okay, we okay. do. <laughs> Continue. And you got to remember now we're all, you know, our team. So it was really crazy. You know, the dog boys got together and kept doing Hey Bo Diddley into the the next century, but we're going nuts. The floor toms would collapse under us, the legs would loosen, and we would be sitting on them like we're riding horses, like, you know, bucking broncos. We're playing the front in front of us, and it's total mayhem. And as we're hitting the last chord, the curtain are slowly closing, and out from the wings, Dennis Wilson just runs and leaps on our lead singer, tackles him down, and starts punching him in the face. A total all-out brawl right in front of the thousands of people. And I'm like in shock now. I'm, I think, what, 14, something like that. And I can't believe, because I, and he's swearing up a storm. I can't, I don't want to even, I don't know if you're allowed to swear on this show, but he's going at it. Every four-letter word is coming out. And I'm, I'm more in shock at that. that if, I didn't know famous people knew these, these swear words. I'm like, what? Dennis Wilson is saying the F word over? I can't believe it. And, you know, Scavone's a tough guy. And if he wanted to, he could have kicked Dennis's ass. But they they kind of got into like a standoff. And they had to be pulled apart. And everybody's just standing there in shock. What just happened? And we apologized profusely. And then we found out later that one of the reasons they were so uptight was Carl Wilson was in some sort of like draft evasion yeah. situation that like that week and they were, they were all tense about that and they apologized and we went home with our tails between our legs but it was just, i tell you man that is one of the greatest rock and roll stories of all time it was it was a crazy time <laughs> it certainly was hang on i'm getting oh it's dennis wilson's on the phone wants to talk to you <laughs> From uh, I'll just get rid of that story. <laughs> yeah, in 1968, you had an incredibly interesting encounter at Manny's Music uh, did, in New yeah. York. Uh, tell us about that one. We were again going in to do some, you know, Meshuggah kind of audition or uh, recording session, 
It's long forgotten. This was when the Doughboys were down to three members. We became a, a power trio. And uh, went into Manny's to buy drumsticks. You know, it was right before closing time. And I go in, buy my sticks, and I hear some guitar noodling coming from the back of the store. So I just kind of wander back there. The store is basically empty. There's some salesmen around. And it's Jimi Hendrix. And he's sitting down playing a Les Paul and standing above him watching was Frank Zappa. <laughs> and me. As he would be. <laughs> yeah. And it's just me and them. And I'm like sitting and I'm now, yeah. I got to stick around for this. <laughs> so I, I sit down and I'm listening to Hendrix play and just being blown away by this whole thing. He takes a break, he's talking to Frank and going back and forth. And I got the nerve to just say or ask, do you ever look for uh, a left-handed Les Paul? I know such a right-handed one. And he, he was very nice and gentle and soft-spoken. He said, no, nah, man, I, I really, I think these right-handed ones, I like having the, the knobs up here when I play. He was like talking to me like I was a fellow music, musician. I'm a kid, you know, it's like 68, I'm like 16, 17. And he was very nice. And I, I never do this, but I asked for their autograph. And I had a, a napkin. And they both signed it, Jimmy. Well, Frank Zappa said, thank you, Frank Zappa. And it's the first time I ever got an autograph. I was so impressed. Like, he's thanking me. And, I thought, oh, that's <laughs> nice. and then Jimi Hendrix wrote, be groovy, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, I guess they're long gone now, right? My family moved out of our house where we live in. And somewhere in the shuffle, the autograph got went missing. I remember walking on stage after Cream, Cream's performance at Massey Hall, which was like our Carnegie Hall. And in those days, there was two sets of stairs on each side. So we just walked up on the stage and went right backstage to the dressing rooms, right as you would. Yeah. And uh, we walked into Clapton's uh, dressing room. He was covered in, you know, photographers and press guys. But same thing. He just said, hey, you know, would you mind? And signed it and put it in a drawer at home, never saw it again. So, I know, things were so different back then. It was real different. I mean, I, I tell the story real quick in the book about seeing the Yardbirds. Yeah. And this was the four-man Yardbirds with Jimmy Page. <clears throat> and they're doing uh, their encore. Jimmy Page breaks a string and they do another song and the string's dangling. And then he broke another string. And at one point, the lead singer... Uh, Keith Ralph said, Jimmy, our guitar player, can play without, you know, <laughs> one string. And he can play without two, but he can't play without three. So good night. And, <laughs> like, there's no backup guitar. There's no roadies. There's nobody, you know, tuning another guitar frantically for him. That was it. He had that guitar there, and the strings broke, and the concert was over. Yeah. And that, good thing it didn't happen. Yeah. Actually, you know, we talked about this on the phone the other day, but after that incident on May the 2nd, 65, uh, when the Stones played that night and did the last time, I don't know if you checked it out, but right at the end of Keith Richards' solo, he busts a string. You told me about that. On yeah. a Les Paul. And you can, he's off camera, but you can hear it go, but doink. And yeah. then the look on his face is abject terror because he's on the Ed Sullivan show in front of <laughs> you know, 60 million people and his guitar is completely out of tune. But it was like that in those days. I mean, they didn't have a roadie handing you a guitar every song, you know? I know, so I, simple. I read in your book, I counted actually, you had your uh, misspent youth, uh, how many times you went to see concerts at the <laughs> Phil Morris. And I counted 90. You missed that 100 show. Well, but you, well you, a, lot, a lot of those were double and triple bill. So it probably wasn't okay, so you saw the other bands. But nine, I just, nine different great classic. Give me three that stand out that were like the top three of all those artists you saw. Right. Well, my top live show of all time, including everybody, is Procol Harum at the Fillmore. I love... DJ Wilson, the drummer from Procol Harum. He's another one that just is right up there with the best of the best. And that whole band live just sounded so majestic is the word that comes to mind. <clears throat> and the uh, vocals, Gary Brooker, just kind of like a real soulful English Ray Charles-y kind of voice. And I mean, the Fillmore had a 
beautiful sounding system, sound system, and great acoustics and the ambience there was terrific. And it was the ultimate musical experience as far as concerts go. Jimi Hendrix at Hunter College is in my top five favorite concerts. But that, that was, uh, I, I saw him at the Fillmore too, but Hunter College was where he really blew me away. And uh, was Mitch and Noel still with him? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that experience line up a few times. I saw their very last tour and they did Madison Square Garden when it was still in the round. They would play in the middle. And that was with Mitch and Noel, so that was cool. Um, you know, Jimmy went on to do Band of Gypsies and a couple other incarnations, but nothing can top Mitch Mitchell with Jimmy. I mean, that, that's- You know, I never saw Hendrix. I'm still kicking my- yeah, yeah, Elvis, was, I never saw in Hendrix, I never saw- But, but you know, when I, when I saw Hendrix, the thing that stuck in my mind was how musical it was. You know, you're thinking Jimi Hendrix is going to be a wild cacophony, but it was very, very arranged music, dynamics. And they were doing that song, Up From The Skies, I think it's called, right? And Up From The Skies, yeah. With the, you know, Mitch is playing with brushes. Yeah. And I remember you could hear the hi-hat with his foot. And this is before all the close micing, you know, they had a couple mics on it. But I'm thinking, God, this is like a, going to see a great jazz artist. I'm hearing that hi-hat, you know, and it's like a rock concert. And I was so impressed with that. Yeah. And, and as they, a drummer, of course, you would yeah. pick up those little new and then And then when they want to rock out, you know, then it's the Jimi Hendrix experience. Another one that comes to mind, which, because I didn't really have any expectations, and it just washed over me how great it was, was uh, the Jeff Beck group. Oh, yeah. First with time Rod Stewart? With Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood. And yeah. Nicky Hopkins. Was, I mean, that was pretty damn impressive. And the thing, and I was sitting right, this is at the film, I was sitting right in front of Jeff Beck, you know, and his amp. And, stuff, and it was just amazing because. He's he, Jeff Beck. <laughs> yeah, it's Jeff Beck. Yeah. And the thing that I, I really got from him was it wasn't how fast he was playing. It was just the finesse, the tone, yeah. the choice of notes. Same, you know, with Clapton. It's like those guys, it wasn't all about, you know, I'm the fastest guy in the world. It was just all these elements, especially tone. Yeah. And phrasing. Beck has always been my favorite guitar player. You know, and then Beck later, of course, yeah. came up with a whole new bag of tricks wow. that he added on wow. all the other stuff. But back yeah. then, this is, I guess we're talking 68, I think. Yeah. So, so that that was a top top show. I I could go on and on. I saw, oh, I saw yeah, shows. we could do this for hours. I, can we get Nancy back in the room? Is she around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's on, back on the bed. She's taking a ah, Hello, Nancy. This is Nancy Lay. She's uh, the missus. Hi, Greg. Hi, sweetie. Hi. I wanted to get you uh, on this for the end part of the show because you have got a big part uh, to play in the recording of Richard's music. And, of course, this for people at home, this is the, this is the new album copious notes hair made out of music notes this is a phenomenal record thank you thank you how did you aside from the fact that you guys are married and all that how did it come about that you would end up playing bass in the band uh, singing in the band engineering the band running the business and all the rest of that how did how did that happen well um let me think back uh, i i i played the audition yeah yeah i i, I never really played bass um, but we, Richard got, Richard used to look in the Village Voice for classified ads just to meet other musicians who were looking for drummers or guitar players or whatever. And there was some guy who had an ad that he was looking for a drummer who could play like Keith Moon. And we're like, uh, you know, obviously this is, the, you know, th this is the guy. So we, we went to some rehearsal studio and it was just Richard and this guy on guitar and he was good. He, he could play like Townsend. And there was no bass player, but there was a bass in the room. So uh, Richard said, Nancy, pick up the bass and we'll do uh, Can't Explain. And it's just, you know, and I played a little guitar, so I knew where the A was, I knew where the E was. So it's like, da, 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 da. And because he's such a phenomenal drummer, 
I thought I sounded good. And so um, we had had the confidence builder. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I have a good sense of rhythm. But anyway, we'd, we'd had various bass players. My brother plays bass. And um, we were in need of a bass player at that point for our band because like the last one had quit or something. So Richard decided that I was going to be the bass player. So we uh, he taught me every song just sort of note by note. And I learned them and I all of a sudden there's like, oh, I can do this. And so that was the beginning. And that was back in the 80s, I guess, because before that I played keyboards yeah. in the band. She's being very modest now. She plays classical piano yeah. and, and uh, guitar <laughs> very well. And <laughs> that's so, also the other thing about you speaking of modest. I mean, if when people go through, you know, the credits and they read they read all the stuff that you do, you know, I mean. You started out as a drummer. This is what really freaks me out. You, you started out as a, as a guy that can't play a musical instrument, okay? Well, hey, hey, and, hey, and then hey. all of a sudden, that was a joke. And then all of a sudden, you can play phenomenal piano, phenomenal guitar, phenomenal banjo, whatever the hell you pick up, you play it extremely well. And now she's a multi-instrumentalist as well. That's why we're together to the stage. No, I don't. <laughs> you know, yeah, the drums is my main instrument. I look at the piano as a percussion instrument. So it's an extension of the drumming. <clears throat> the guitar, I have to admit, was a real struggle for me because I have drummer's hands. And it's like, oh, you got to actually play these chords. I couldn't believe that people could go from a G to a C chord. How the hell do you do that? And it took, you know, it would take me a good like 80 seconds to get from the G over to that C and get the fingers in line. I said, people actually do this and go back and forth. But, you know, you keep doing it and slowly, you know, you get the, what do they call it? The uh, mental um, memory. Muscle, muscle memory. Mu yeah. Muscle memory, that's what it is. And so that's, your fingers start to cooperate. Yeah. But as far as, you know, yeah, all these recordings, it's, um, it's about the song. You know, it's about always coming, about the song first. It's all about coming up with parts for the song, and you know, we all grew up with all the stuff that we've been talking about. So you start to, you know, formulate some ideas about arrangement and parts, and then I have Nancy, like a you know, driving me with a whip until I get it right. <laughs> and I'm very opinionated. She, you know, she, it's <laughs> got to be in tune, you know, in tune and in time. In tune. Yeah, and uh, she just is a hard task master, master and uh, mistress. Mistress. <laughs> did, did, <laughs> Nancy, did you take an engineering course? I mean, oh, you, no. you do a lot of recording in the apartment, right? Yeah, yeah it's all we do now. I mean, you know, we so, started out like everybody going to the studio, spend all our money, you know, and, and we were working with this engineer Tony Lewis, who we use to this day to mix our stuff. And when home recording first came in, he was the one who said, "You guys." got a record at home get yourself these ADATs and he came over and he set it up and he gave me a crash course and how to do it and I, I picked these things up pretty fast so that's when we started recording you know just doing like the raw tracks at home and then send them to Tony to, to do the mix which we still do because I think you know getting his ears involved is always a plus so, so he's not playing drums in the apartment you, you go, no, no, no. go to a studio we go studio to with the drums and then start tracking everything at home and yeah, we go to this really nice studio in our neighborhood called East Side Sound I'd like to give them a plug because it's a real state-of-the-art studio with the best of everything all the outboard yeah you could all the mics and, and I set up in the middle of the room, it's Rogers drum kit. I, I happen to use Rogers now. I have I have a Ludwig kit as well, but they ha just coincidentally have a vintage Rogers kit that I like. So I, I use their house kit. I set it up and I just sit there all for a whole weekend and do drum track after drum track with you know no music. And we take those home and then it's the layer cake method. We just start building up from the drums. Yeah. That's how we've been doing it. Right. But uh, how would you guys like to uh, end off the show by playing us a little song? Well, it is a little past our bedtime. You know, this, we're in the kit factory, but we're going to christen it now the Kip factory <laughs> and get a little shut eye. A little, we're going to visit the land of Nod if it's okay with you. Well, it's okay. And I just want people to know that 
these are only seven of the 14 albums you two wonderful geniuses have made. Oh. And I, as you know, I am your biggest fan. I mean, I, I, really appreciate I, I will always thank Ray Paul for turning me. People don't know this story, but uh, Cornerstone was uh, the first album I ever heard that they did. And I was just starting to write my book, Travels with My Amp, and I put it in the, the, the computer modem and it got stuck in there. And I listened to it for 14 months over and over, <laughs> and, over and over. And that's what got me hooked. And, and that song, All I Have, is my favorite, by the way. It's oh, just, you, you know, I know you're not going to do that now. But I want to thank, um, uh, no, Nancy, it's Lay instead of Lee. 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 Oh, it's Lee. Yeah. Okay, I, okay well, Lee, I blew it off. Lee, the Lee. That's my middle name. Okay. My oh, Nancy Lee yeah. and Richard X. Heyman. And the X is real. And uh, in New York City, I I can't thank you guys enough for being on the show. Oh, so and I think they're gonna they're gonna switch over to me right now, so I can talk for a second, and then we're gonna, gonna crawl off to bed if it's okay. That's okay. Well, thanks for, uh, for all the people in Canada and Toronto watching. This has been a great treat for me, and and I'm really hoping that you know people will start discovering your music because I, I think I think it's a drag that nobody across the world found my music, but I think it's a bloody oh. tragedy that they didn't <laughs> find yours, man. I mean, uh, we appreciate your positivity and support. It's very welcome. And I'd just like to thank the Canadians for sending down Joni Mitchell. <laughs> and Gordon Lightfoot. Gordon Lightfoot and Neil Young. Well, you'll be surprised when you get your mail next week. <laughs> I, mail, I, I mailed you, Gord. Yeah, but most of all, Wayne and Schuster. Oh, yes. <laughs> because <laughs> I was old. just talking to Nancy about how Ed Sullivan must, I, I know, I've heard the story, he worked out some sort of deal with Canada, and part of the deal was having Wayne and Schuster on, like, at least like once a month. We saw yeah. every one of them, man. We were yeah. proud of them, too. So I guess you guys uh, give us a song, and, uh, and I'll uh, introduce it as soon as, uh, anyway, get out of here. We'll see you from, soon. Do you mind if we sing in bed? You can do that. Thank you. We appreciate it. From the Cornerstone album. <sighs> Now let's do this work. Come on. Let's do this work. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 One, two, three, four. Push out.
Be well, be safe. Hey, you know, dear, what a right. About what? Those 15 minutes. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's do it. Yes. Let's go back to sleep. Yeah. Love you, dear. Love you. Come on, little rookie. You and me. Oh, okay.